is Pastor Robbie, and I um, work with the students and young adults here, and so I have a wonderful time doing that, and I'm privileged to share God's Word with you all this morning. Go ahead and turn with me to John uh, chapter 15, verse 5, and that's where we're going to be. Um, earlier this summer, I, when I was speaking with you guys, I had the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the process of traveling. And some of you guys traveled this summer, um, some of you guys had various experiences, but even better than traveling is arriving. So um, some of you guys know if you travel with kids, you don't have to hear, are we there yet anymore? You don't have to deal with that question. Um, But there's something key about arriving that if you love Jesus, you get right. And that's that when you arrive somewhere, the first thing you're supposed to do is unpack your bag, okay? Anybody else, first thing you do, you unpack, even if you're there for, okay. I have a few people that love the Lord, and the rest of you are cat people, okay? So, um, but, but here's the deal. This is something that drives my wife crazy, but even if we're staying somewhere for a night or two, if we arrive at a hotel, I have to unpack. I've got to get everything settled. I've got to be there. I've got to be kind of ready to go and planning to uh, enjoy the stay, right? So today, we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of what it means to kind of settle in with Jesus in the sense that you are going to remain. You're going to be there. You're going to uh, be at a place of establishment. And so we're going to start off in verse 5 of John chapter 15, and we're going to read through the rest of this section of Scripture later on throughout the message. But this is such a key verse, and it's something that really should stop us in our tracks and cause us to think, um, what are we settled in on? What are we abiding in? And here's the thing. You guys are seeing Love Serve Go on our banners. You're going to see it on our website. You're going to see it on our social media. And today, as we think about uh, if we love God and what our relationship with Jesus looks like and fulfilling the first commandment, it's important for us to realize what are we settled in on? What are we abiding in? What are we uh, putting all of our faith and hope and investment in? Because if we get that wrong, Jesus is really clear by telling us that we've missed the whole point of our lives. So join with me in reading um, verse 5 in John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This word abide is used throughout this passage several times, and I'll never forget um, when my wife and I went on our honeymoon, we went to Jamaica, and and we stayed in this all-inclusive, and it was incredible. And we get there, and I'm feeling like, okay, I'm going to eat more pizza than is humanly possible. And that's probably why I'm a youth pastor, right? It's because, like, I think of this all-inclusive, and the first thing that's on my mind is, like, free pizza. Okay, so that's, that's kind of where my mind was at. So we're having this incredible time. We're just, uh, you know, indulging in, in all of these incredible things. The scenery is beautiful, and I'm just thinking, like, this is incredible that I get this opportunity to be in this beautiful place experiencing all of this. This is awesome. Um, but there was something that was amazing, and this was also, now I value it even more because I was traveling without children, so it wasn't like I had to bring an entire caravan of who knows what, all right? So we're just there. And there was this feeling as we were traveling of, you know what? We need to change our address and get rid of our luggage and just stay right here because everything we need is here. Everything we need is in this place. I don't have to go anywhere to find a meal. I don't have to go anywhere to find anything that I need. And you know what? The sign tells me what I paid for is all-inclusive. So they're not going to run out of what I need, okay? They're going to have what I came for. But a lot of us don't view our relationship with Jesus that way. A lot of us wonder, is God really as good as he says he is? Does he really have enough where we could abide with him? Does he really have enough where we could take him up on this offer? Psalm 1611 is this incredible verse that a lot of you guys are familiar with, but he says, it says, you make known to me the path of life. 
In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Ephesians 2, 4 through 8 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. God is not worried about running out of what you and I need the most. We see this passage and we see this emphasis on the riches of God's grace and mercy. And here's the thing. We get this feeling so much more so when we realize how good Jesus is, kind of like what I had at that all-inclusive of like, man, I don't deserve to be here. This is incredible. This is So we get this picture of being seated in the heavenly places with Jesus according to his riches. But so often we're deceived into believing that maybe He doesn't have enough for us. Maybe he's going to get tired of us. Maybe he's going to figure out that we don't deserve to be here. We don't deserve this type of inheritance. We don't deserve to abide in this place. And it's because Scripture is very clear that Satan desires to still kill and destroy us. That is really active from our enemy. That he desires to mistreat us in such a way that we would even disbelieve the goodness of our Father. And when this happens, we settle for this suitcase type of relationship with God where we're like, we'll come, we'll check things out maybe in desperation, but surely we're not going to unpack here. Surely he, he wouldn't let us stay here for a while. You know what, maybe I'll just be here for a season and see if he answers my prayer immediately or see if he does exactly what I thought I needed, but surely he's not going to allow us to stay. And maybe even more damaging, some of us think that we have kind of a suitcase God who's ready at any moment to say, you know what, if you mess up, I'm packing up and I'm getting out of here because I'm not going to deal with you. I'm not going to continue uh, to, to work with you. But what we see in verse 5, if you look through this, is it, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me, and I in him. And so we see this picture of him being willing to remain or abide in us. We see this picture of him being willing to stay with us no matter where we are. Romans 8.38 says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's an incredible reminder that in Jesus, we have a loving Father that remains with us through it all. And we see that what is in it in this abiding for him is a relationship with you whom he loves. And that's incredible because we see this picture really in the father of the prodigal son who's awaiting the return of his child who's gone off and really ruined his life. But so many of us believe that God looks at us and thinks, you know what? I hope you get what you deserve. I hope while you're out there running things your own way that you just ruin the rest of your life and I'm never going to let you back. But that's not the picture we have in the Bible. He's a father that's waiting for us to return. He's excited. He says, even if your worst day was yesterday, I would allow you to come back and remain in me and have this restored relationship. Just like any of you who have children would view towards your kids. So it's time for us to decide this morning where we're going to abide. And it really is a decision that affects everything. It brings about all or nothing in our lives. And so the repercussions are are so severe. I love this story from Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. If you guys want to turn there for a moment. 
And it gives us a beautiful picture of someone who was willing to abide in Christ. Someone who was willing to say, you know what, all of the other places that I had put my trust in, all the other uh, people that I had believed in, every season where I believed that if things would just change for a moment that I could handle it on my own, she says, no more. And she steps into this audacious scene and we see this picture of what it looks like for her to abide. Verse 36 of Luke 7 says, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them off with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You know, I think the difference between the Pharisees in this picture and the woman is that they had observed Jesus, but they hadn't abided in him. There was this moment of, hey, you know what? Come in, have dinner with us. We've seen you do these things. We've heard this teaching, and maybe there's even this kind of pompous attitude of like, oh man, if we can get the Savior, uh, Jesus, who's doing all these things, who's talk of the town, who's popular to come in and have dinner with us, um, maybe we'll teach him a thing or two. Maybe uh, he'll kind of take on our agenda. Any of these things could happen. But she comes in and she worships. And when they see this moment, they say, hey, if you knew who that was, you, you would be a prophet. You would be Jesus. You, you would maybe be the Savior. But there's no way, we, we know who she is, there's no way that you would let someone like that in here. And he says, no, 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 no. She has loved much. She understands what it means to abide in me. She understands what it means to put her faith solely in me. And that's what makes all the difference. And so in the rest of this passage, we're going to see that there's some immediate fruit that comes from abiding. There's some promises that we receive for those who place their faith solely in Christ. And, it, and it's really a beautiful thing. So um, in verse six, it says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers and branches, the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Verse seven says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So here's kind of this first fruit that we see from abiding. It's a dynamic prayer life. This passage tells us that when we look to Jesus, when we abide in him, that we ask and we receive. Now, the incredible thing is the more we abide in him, the more our wishes and our desires change. And some of you feel like that's a trick. I've heard that before. That is not the same. That's not me getting what my wishes are. And, and here's the question. If everyone apart from Jesus around you, your family, your coworkers, your friends, whoever in society you can think of, if they all got what they wanted today, 
Do you think that would solve the problems of their heart? There was a story out of India recently, some of you guys have heard it, of a young man that wanted a jaguar. And in a fit of rage, he pushed his new BMW into a canal. Do you think if he got the jaguar, the issues of his heart would have been solved? I don't think so. Philippians 3 Paul talks about his former life. He talks about everything he had gained. He talked about the stability. He talked about really this kingdom that he had built. But then he says, now that I know Jesus, I count it all as loss. And then in verse 11 of Philippians 3, he says, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. We see from his testimony that his new wish is more of Jesus his new wish is if it costs him everything, it is like nothing compared to knowing Christ. And so we see this incredible promise of if we would abide in Jesus, we would actually have the things which we need the most, which actually bring us fulfillment. But the things that we want apart from Christ are just vapors. They don't last. They don't do anything for our hearts. I can't even count the number of Christmas and birthday presents that I begged my parents for as a child that ended up at a yard sale shortly after. Some of them are still collecting dust in their garage. Okay, don't tell them, all right? So here's the next thing we see. Verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So second is fulfilling the purpose of your life. So one, dynamic prayer life. Second, fulfilling the purpose of your life. Um, there's kind of a, a joke about this, but it's kind of sad about how many early 30-year-olds are living on their parents' couch, right? And some of you guys have experienced that. Some of you guys are you know, you're like kicking your teenager right now. You're like, that's why you need to get good grades and get a job and do well. Okay. So here's the thing. We see this actually in career life and also in relationships. Um, this generation is struggling. This generation is struggling to find the purpose of life. And they're looking for it in careers and relationships. And this is arguably a generation that is statistically further from Jesus than any generation before. This should not surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us that we are struggling to flourish in life apart from Christ. It makes total sense, and this passage talks about bearing fruit, glorifying our Father, which is the thing that we were made to do. So there's this yearning in our lives when we're not glorifying God of how can we do this in any way, but when we are not abiding in Christ, when we're abiding in all sorts of different things that we feel like we can trust in, we keep inventing new methods of fulfillment that don't really work. In Proverbs chapter 3, we see trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Okay, so some of you guys use a GPS, and you um, maybe see these alternate routes, and maybe you argue about the quickest way. Okay, the quickest way to fulfillment in your life is by trusting the route that God has given you. Here's the hard part. We are called to bear fruit. When we look at fruit and, and a vine being planted, it's not like we look at a branch one day and the next thing you know, there's an abundance of grapes, okay? Or whatever it is that you're looking for, that's a it's not like it happens overnight. So sometimes we kind of have this suitcase relationship with God where we're like, you know what, Jesus, we're trying you today. And if all my problems don't wipe away tomorrow, then I'm out of here. But there's this beautiful process that happens in our life when he produces life in us and when he brings about this fruit that actually changes us. But then um, it says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. 
It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as the father, the son in whom he delights. So here's this incredible picture. You know, a lot of us are familiar with the beginning of that passage. But as we go throughout those verses, it gets personal. He talks about moral decisions. He talks about uh, financial management. He talks about uh, the, the way that he often disciplines us. And it's this incredibly personal fatherly picture. I have a two and a half year old. If I'm not involved in every area of her life, she's in trouble. As a matter of fact, if I withdraw to an extent, I'm going to prison for neglect, right? But when God gets involved in every area of our life as a father, we say he's invading our privacy. And that's something for each of us to think about because he is an incredible heavenly father that even if it takes discipline, even if it takes correction, wants to bring you in, into a life where you are bearing fruit. Here's the third thing. A wholehearted life. Verse 9 says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So one, we see this awareness of a father's love within this, and then we see a fullness of joy. It's incredible that God is not just concerned with the exteriors of our life, but he's also invested in our well-being, us having a fullness of joy. You know, um, growing up, my favorite place on earth was in Gibsonville, North Carolina, and it was at my mama and papa's house. Anybody else have a mama and papa? Yeah, you guys are blessed for that. So, um, so I remember running around the yards, and, and I would go see other family members that lived across the street, and I could jump on the trampoline. I could play on the same basketball goal that my dad grew up playing on. I could walk in the fields with my papa, and I could go in the house. And because I was spoiled... I could have access to whatever I wanted. If there was, you know, uh, something in the fridge, a snack that I wanted, even if it was before dinner time, like that was okay. I was going to, you know, it was going to be fine. Um, so there's this incredible picture and feeling that I had, even as a young boy, of access. There was this peace and joy and belonging. And what we see here is that when we abide in Christ, we get this fullness of joy. We get this place that our heart yearns for of saying, this is what it feels like to be in the place that I should be. This is what it feels like to have access in my father's house. This is what it feels like to be where I belong. And, and we get a fading picture of that, just moments of glory and hope while we live that on earth, awaiting our ultimate destination, which is unity in, with Christ in heaven forever. And so even our best moments on earth are just fading pictures of the glory that awaits us. And when we abide in Christ, that awakens our heart to love God more. When we look at the rest of the passage, though, we see that there's a great deal of clarity that with Jesus, we have everything. And without him, we have nothing. We've talked a great deal about verse 5 and kind of surrounded it. And a lot of us read 
Verse 5 is, I am the vine, you are the branches. And we say, okay, it's fine, got it, good illustration, okay. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Okay, sign me up, Lord, abiding fruit, that's great. I, I, I would love um, all the blessings and all the things that, you know, Robbie just talked about. Okay, so maybe uh, we'll, we'll see if this kind of works out. But then comes the hard part for many of us. Where he says, for apart from me, you can do a few things. Oh, no, he didn't say that. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, it, it's incredible how hard this can be for us. In a world that calls for us loving all sorts of different things in a world of distraction, in a world where we can be focused on so many things that seem to scream for priority right now. Maybe we hear this verse or maybe we've heard sermons on it and, you know, we get in the car and we're like, wow, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And maybe your spouse or your friend says, well, it's a metaphor. What Jesus really meant was I think we should be really careful when we hear something like this and when we say what Jesus really meant was whatever makes you more comfortable. It is by God's grace that we have even one more breath. And I'm concerned that our families our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and our churches even can get to a place where we even start for a second to believe that we can do some decent things apart from Jesus, that we can do anything meaningful apart from him. And it says, apart from me, you can do nothing. In Acts 17, 28, Paul is speaking in Athens to people who don't know Jesus. They're, they've sought after all types of philosophies and other gods, and he quotes this ancient poet and he begins to show how this is true only in Christ. And he says, in him, we live and move and have our being. In Jesus, we live and move and have our being. That changes not just how we spend our Sunday mornings, but I, I pray that that changes how I interact with God and with others every moment. When we see that Jesus truly is our source of life, it changes everything. He says, he is the vine, we are the branches. A branch, if attached to the source of life, bears fruit. But apart from that, if we were to hold a branch or a stick up here, I could, I could shake it, I could stare at it, I could you know, put it in a vase of water or whatever, but it's not going to have fruit up here. That's how drastic it is for us to live our lives apart from Christ, expecting that anything we could do would bring us joy, would change our marriages, would change our children, or have any lasting impact on what we do on earth. It's Silly. But there's also a bit of a warning in verse 6. And I want to close by reading this because we see this incredible offer that we're a branch and we're called to remain and life can flow through us because of God's power and goodness. But if we do not remain in Jesus, if we do not abide in him, if we do not say, I can't do things on my own, I need you. Then it says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to see the picture there. It's this, all or nothing. And a lot of us would say, well, 
And maybe even the Pharisees at the table with this sinful woman would have said, okay, what he really means is if you abide in your works, you'll also be okay. You know what? You're, you're in high school. If you abide in getting good grades and making it through school and maybe even doing your own thing, you can catch back up with me when you're 30 or when you're older and you'll be fine. Maybe they would have heard, you know what? You can take a season off and abide in your career. Jesus says, I, I, I bring life to all of those things. And apart from me, even the things that your culture would justify, even the things that uh, your neighbors would say, hey, this is okay, they don't produce anything. And so my prayer for you and I today is that for those of us who are in Christ, <laughs> our hearts would be ignited to love Jesus more fully because we realize that moment by moment, he changes everything. And I realize that I, I can't produce anything on my own. And so then my heart begins to change because I realize, man, I, I have been given this incredible gift that I, I did not deserve. But maybe some of you in here this morning are at a place where you've tried to abide in a lot of decent things, and maybe you've thought, I'm going to try this Jesus thing a little bit, but I'm not totally sure. My prayer today is that you would realize this is an all or nothing decision, and you have the opportunity to say, yes, Jesus, you are the only source of life, and, and I am putting all my hope, all my faith in you. Let's pray.